What's going on, guys? My name is Josh Settledge, and I am the BJJ Strength Coach. Welcome to episode 11 of the Strength Matrix podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing three unique tools that you could use to develop your conditioning. Now, these tools are not only going to help you enhance your conditioning, but also make your make greater conditioning gains to enhance your overall jiu-jitsu performance. And I'm going to show you guys how you can structure the use of these specific tools to help you prepare for jiu-jitsu competition. But before we dive right into it, I do want to let you guys know that this episode, just like every other episode, is brought to you by TheStrengthMatrix.com. TheStrengthMatrix.com is your one-stop shop, your central hub for all of your grappling, strength, and conditioning needs. As I'm sure you guys know, it's kind of hard nowadays to find sound strength and conditioning training specifically for jiu-jitsu athletes. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of BS out there about how to really train for jiu-jitsu. And the Strength Matrix is here to cut through all that noise and guarantee that it's going to help you get stronger, be more explosive, improve your conditioning so ultimately you can win more matches and get injured less. The Strength Matrix has everything from elite world-class training programs educational content and courses that you could uh, follow and take so that way you are you are not only better equipped to train more and be a better athlete on the mat but you're actually able to learn the methods and the secrets so that way you can maximize the effect of your training and ultimately roll harder on the mat train smarter in the gym win more matches and get injured less now the strength matrix is offering a free four-week strength program to listeners of this podcast. All you got to do is just click the link in the description below of this podcast episode. You can drop in your email and you'll be able to download that training program for free. I definitely suggest you check that out. So let's start right into it. Three unique tools to develop your conditioning. Now, I don't know if you guys think this first one is unique. I kind of consider it unique. It's not unique to me, but sometimes when I talk to other grappling athletes about it, they're like, oh, I I didn't even know you really could use that for conditioning. I see people use it all the time, but um, I never really use it. I'm only on the treadmill or I only do jujitsu or I only run. So the first one is going to be the concept to rower. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a minute now, you'll recognize I am a huge fan of using the Concept2 or the C2 rower as a means for developing grappling-specific conditioning. And there's a lot of reasons why. The Concept2 rower, as of late, has been popping up a lot more in different gyms across the world, widely due to the explosion of CrossFit a little over a decade ago. And I know for me, in commercial gyms, I really didn't see a lot of rowing machines anywhere. I only saw them at CrossFit gyms when I was doing CrossFit in high school. And then once I started work, actually working at a commercial gym, I saw that on the fitness floor, they had four or maybe five, four or five concept, like brand new concept two rowers. And that's when I knew that things were really taking a shift and people were catching on to the benefits and the um, effectiveness of using the C2 rower as means for conditioning. Now, the other thing that helped me fall in love slash fall into a deep, hateful, spiteful relationship with the concept to a rower. Depends on what kind of training you're doing with that thing. But my dad, uh, when I was in high school, he, so we'll rewind a little bit. When my dad was in college, he went to Sac State University and he was actually part of the rowing team uh, at Sac State. And so he was an experienced rower. I think he did it for a year at the college level. Um, And he really enjoyed rowing and he enjoyed using uh, rowing as means for exercise. And so he, when CrossFit was blown up and he saw like, oh, they got rowing machines. Like, that's pretty cool. So Concept2 made them. And so he just ordered one. And so in high school, uh, I had access to a rowing machine in my parents' garage all throughout high school, all throughout college. And that was awesome because rain or shine, whether you wanted to or not, there was really no excuse to get your conditioning work done uh, on that Concept2 rower. Now, what makes the Concept2 rower or the C2 rower such a great piece of equipment is that it is a full body, concentric only form of conditioning. Now, when we talk about uh, a concentric only movement, we need to recognize that in every muscle action, so let's say we're doing a bicep curl, the concentric motion of that exercise is going to be the working phase or the upward phase. That's where the muscle is actually contracting. So you're raising the dumbbell up towards your shoulder. That's the concentric. Now, at any point in that range of motion, if we stop or have a pause, that's going to be called an isometric. 
And then the downward phase or the lengthening of the muscle is going to be called the eccentric phase. Now, it's important to recognize that eccentric loading causes the most amount of muscle damage. So when you do uh, a typical workout and you're doing exercises that have both uh, concentric, isometric, and eccentric loading involved, uh, that's ultimately what's going to cause the most amount of muscle damage and leave you pretty sore afterwards. And so when we talk about sprinting, a lot of times the eccentric or the deceleration at the end of those sprints can cause a lot of people to be sore. People who run a whole lot or if they're running downhill, there's a lot of absorption. There's a lot of eccentric loading running downhill and they can feel a little banged up afterwards. What's nice about the, the C2 rower is that there's no eccentric loading that happens on the rower when compared to running or sprinting. And it's a full body exercise, which is amazing. You get a ton of work for your upper back, some good work for your arms. You're really driving through with your legs. It's very friendly on the joints. And again, we're going to highlight that is a concentric only form of conditioning. Now, finding forms of concentric only conditioning like the C2 rower, the rogue echo bike, the assault bike, um, swimming in a pool or sled dragging can really help you level up your conditioning without leaving you too sore afterwards. And that's very important because we don't want to condition ourselves at the expense that we're going to be super banged up and not be able to perform our best at jujitsu. Eccentric loading, like I said, is what causes the most amount of muscle damage and often often leaves you the most sore afterwards. And concentric only conditioning allows you to go really hard in the paint without beating yourself up too much. The C2 rower has a lot of different metrics that can be used to dial in your conditioning training. And this is something that I'm a big fan of when I work with athletes around the world one-on-one -on -one or working with athletes within the strength matrix and part of the strength matrix team. But the concept two rower makes it very easy for you to track your pace. It's going to be the number um, in the center of the screen that has a uh, a number slash 500 meters. And that's your 500 meter pace. So if you're rowing at a good clip, it may say, you know, one minute and 45 seconds slash 500 meters. That means you're rowing at an average pace of a one minute and 45 second, 500 meter time. Now, if you're not a trained runner or cyclist, it can be really difficult to determine the pace at which you're running or cycling. Without knowing this information, you miss out on being able to track and carefully monitor your training, make progressions each and every single week. And it's, it can be hard to track sometimes uh, how hard you're going on a certain run or on a certain bike ride. You know, when you don't have a pace or you, you're not skilled in tracking your pace and running or cycling, it's like going to the gym and not knowing how much anything weighs. That would definitely make things much more difficult for you. You can load up the plates on the bar or grab dumbbells and you can recognize like, I think this is heavy. I mean, it feels kind of heavy, but I have no idea what this weighs. And I have no idea if this weight is two and a half pounds heavier because they kind of feel the same. And so I don't really know what I'm doing. So the pace allows you to track and carefully monitor your training. You can uh, create prescriptions and like target paces that you want to hit for different conditioning workouts, which is awesome when using the C2 rower. The other thing I like that the C2 rower has in, uh, as far as metrics goes is that it has watts. It also allows you to track your power output in the form of watts. And this is very important to note from when you're developing your anaerobic conditioning for jujitsu. You, you can do different types of training with the C2 rower to enhance your ability to be explosive while under fatigue. And knowing your wattage or knowing your power output is going to be very important. There's a couple of different settings that you could use um, to see how many watts you're putting out per a duration of time or per each individual stroke or individual pull of the handle on the rower. And so there's some things we can do when we're actually designing conditioning training for jujitsu based off of pace, based off of watts to make sure that you're getting the most effective training possible. That's going to be the most specific to the demands of jujitsu. The concept two rower can be used to develop your aerobic conditioning as well. So this is going to be your longer format, lower intensity typically slower paced forms of conditioning and some examples of how I would train an athlete to develop their aerobic conditioning would be three to five rounds of five minutes at say, you know, for example, let's say a two, 205 pace. So you would row on the concept two rower for a total of five minutes 
doing your best to maintain a two minute and five second pace per 500 meters. Something else you can do to develop your aerobic conditioning with the C2 rower is gonna be just 30 minutes of continuous rowing, but within that 30 minutes, every two minutes, you're gonna switch your pace up. So you could do the first two minutes at a 150 pace, the next two minutes at a 210 pace. So you are kind of going higher and lower pace, or I'm sorry, faster and slower paces and kind of working this up and down pace system for the duration of those 30 minutes. Some examples of how I would train an athlete to develop their anaerobic conditioning is going to be eight rounds, 30 seconds on, 90 seconds off. So when you're doing those 30 seconds on, you are pulling that thing as hard as you can. You are trying to get the fastest pace possible, have the biggest power output on every single one of those pulls on the handle and really push yourself for those 30 seconds. Then you're gonna rest for 90 seconds. You can get off the rower if you want to, walk around a little bit, calm your breathing down, bring your heart rate back down, or you can just sit on the rower. Another thing that I like to do, and this is gonna be specific to tracking watts on the Concept2 rower, is uh, I'll, sometimes I'll have athletes do six rounds and they have 15 seconds. So it's a 15 second round. It's really, really short. But in that 15 seconds, they have to hit the highest wattage possible. So this is the entire purpose of this is to maximize power output, to get the highest wattage possible in 15 seconds. After you hit that first round, you're gonna take a two minute rest and then you'll repeat that for a total of six rounds. This is an amazing form of conditioning that you could use to develop your anaerobic conditioning. Now onto the second unique tool that I'm a big fan of for developing jujitsu specific conditioning is gonna be the sled. And I guess you could also put the prowler in there as well. Uh, doing sled drags or uh, prowler pushes they're just an amazing way to develop general physical preparedness or GPP and conditioning. And similarly to the C2 rower, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I'm a huge fan of dragging a sled. And I say dragging a sled, and when I say dragging a sled, you could also assume that I'm talking about pushing a prowler, which is a different form of a sled that you can't really drag, you have to just push it. Um, but they're, they're different, but very similar so much so that I would just throw them in the same category. The sled poses a lot of benefits in increasing your overall general physical preparedness, which of course is very important for jujitsu athletes. General physical preparedness or GPP refers to your base foundation of fitness to do jujitsu and to increase your performance on the mat. And the sled can be loaded heavily and dragged for a really short distance, or it can be loaded with much lighter weights and dragged for a much longer distance. Like the Concept2 rower, the sled is a concentric only movement, which means it can be used to great effect without beating up your body and leaving you super sore afterwards. Something I'll actually have a lot of athletes do either leading up to a competition, so like just a couple days before a big tournament or even a few days after a big tournament, is I'll have them do a lot of sled work. And the reason why is because it's a great way to promote blood flow, it's a great way to stimulate the body a little bit without going too heavy or without beating their joints up too much and it won't leave them too sore, but it's a great way to promote blood flow. It's a great way to get the body moving a little bit, help them stay loose and be fully prepared for competition without getting beat up or getting too sore afterwards. And then the sled is also a great tool for active recovery. So after a competition, if the athlete is really banged up or sore, I'll have them spend a couple days doing a variety of sled training sessions or, or uh, sled focused training sessions. That way they can continue circulating blood, they continue getting in a decent amount of work, but nothing that's going to beat them up so much that it's going to take even longer for them to recover. The sled is an amazing tool for working around injuries. Usually if an athlete is injured from training, nine times out of 10, they can drag a sled or they can push the prowler around for a little bit. If someone has knee pain, if someone got their shoulder tweaked, if someone, um, you know, if someone's elbow hurts, it, it doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what the injury is, but I'll say this, most athletes, even whether they're injured or not injured, can at least do something with the sled. I can't tell you how many times certain athletes that I work with in person have said like, hey coach, I got injured last night at jujitsu. I don't think I'm going to come in this morning. And I just tell them like, look, I'm sorry you got injured. This is the time we're scheduled to train. 
just come in, we'll do something. Let's just do something. Now, most of the time, I have them drag the sled around for a little bit. And sometimes, after the dragging, after dragging the sled for, say, 10, maybe 15 minutes, sometimes that injury, especially if it's a lower body injury, will start to actually feel a lot better. So it's also a great tool for active recovery and rehab. The sled is also a great tool to mix in as part of your warm-ups. Ben Patrick, aka the Knees Over Toes guy, is a huge proponent of the sled. And he has stated that he begins all of his training sessions with some type of sled drag. And trust me, dragging a sled for 10 minutes is a surefire way to light up your lower body and i'm not saying that you have to do exactly what ben patrick does and drag a sled for 10 minutes straight but it is a good idea to include some form of sled dragging into your warm-ups currently the am crew and myself we drag the sled for about three minutes and we drag you know every 60 seconds we're changing our type of sled drag so we might walk forward for 60 seconds and then we might walk backwards for 60 seconds and then maybe we walk sideways for 30 seconds on one side sideways for 30 seconds on the other side there are no special metrics that you can track with the sled outside of how much load is on the sled the distance that you're walking and the overall time they're spending on the sled and you know what that's okay and the main reason because the surface friction may be different for different locations and environments so dragging the sled on turf it may feel a lot different than and and you can keep the same weight and it may feel way different than dragging it on a blacktop or dragging it on a uh, cement sidewalk i know for me that the turf we have at super training gym is really consistent but you can keep the same amount of weight on there and it'll be really tough on the turf and like be really hard to drag and then you drag it on the blacktop and you could almost run with it it's just the friction on different surfaces can be different depending on where you're at so basically all i'm suggesting is just track the load how much load you have on the sled track how much distance you're covering with the sled and then do try to keep track of how much time you're spending uh, dragging the sled I often encourage athletes to test their sled setup with just their body weight and make adjustments for there, from there. So a couple different things you can do with the sled is if you're performing sled sprints, load up something a little less than body weight and see how that feels. If you're working on general physical preparedness and just trying to get a lot of time dragging the sled, get a lot of good concentric only movements, you can keep the load at body weight or maybe even slightly above. If you're trying to get really freaking strong, You can even go much higher than that and go well above body weight. As you play around with it, you'll get more used to how the sled is feeling and how it is used for conditioning training. And some examples of how I would program the sled into someone's conditioning training is kind of similar in format to how I would structure things for uh, the Concept 2 rower. So if we're looking to develop aerobic conditioning or general physical preparedness, I might have an athlete drag the sled continuously for 10 minutes and switch between forward and backward sled drags every two minutes. Now, the other thing that you can do to develop aerobic conditioning with the sled is something called high intensity continuous training, HICT. Now, the HICT method was one that I originally picked up from Joel Jamieson, who is one of the best minds in the conditioning world, specifically for combat sports. For those of you who don't know the name Joel Jamieson, you may be more familiar with the name Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. Uh, Joel worked with Mighty Mouse for many, many, many years as he was one of, if not the greatest MMA fighter at the time of his 125 pound title reign in the UFC. If you're not familiar with MMA or the UFC, specifically Mighty Mouse's flyweight title reign, it was incredible. This guy had a gas tank for days. He was, um, he would do stuff that looks straight out of a movie it looks like he's neo in the matrix it was freaking insane so um i've had the pleasure of meeting joel and talking with him and learning from him in person and in his book ultimate combat or ultimate mma conditioning excuse me there is a lot of great stuff on how to develop conditioning specifically for combat sports and so the high intensity continuous training method is both relatively high intensity and in volume. This method of training is based on working against a high level of resistance for a long duration of time. Now in the book, Joel talks about how the HICT stimulates greater oxygen utilization and results in increased endurance 
of the fast twitch muscle fibers. Now, an easy way that you could start developing these things is with a sled. The sled is a great tool when doing the HICT method because you can just load it up with a decent amount of weight and start walking. And how I would structure this, and this is per some of the recommendations that Joel gives in his book, is I would do one to two sets of 10 to 20 minutes. And you wanna load the sled up with a resistance that keeps you moving your legs at a steady pace so it's not like you every step is you gotta like step and then do another step and it's like like there, it's not segmented you don't want each step to be a rep you want to be continuously walking but you want that walk to be as heavy as possible so you don't want to be drudging along and um i'm trying to think of a good way to explain this you're not running and you are not jogging, you are doing the heaviest walk you can. I guess that's a good way to put it, the heaviest walk you can. And you would essentially wanna do one to two sets of 10 to 20 minutes with the highest resistance that you can that still allows you to do that heaviest walk possible. Now, that's for on the aerobic side. If we switch over and start to look at the anaerobic side to train the other end of the spectrum, you can load the sled with a much lighter load and perform short sprints for a duration of six to 15 seconds. This is super effective. Um, This is something I'll have certain athletes do and you can go sprint backwards, you can sprint forwards, you can sprint sideways, sprint sideways on the other side. And you wanna keep those sprints within the within the six to 15 second time frame. And you're gonna to wanna to rest anywhere from 90 seconds to two minutes between sets on those. And if you have a prowler sled, you can use that as well, except you would just be pushing the prowler sled as opposed to dragging it behind you. Now, the third unique tool that you could use to level up your conditioning is probably one of the weirdest ones, and I do get a lot of questions about this, but that is actually going to be mouth tape. Mouth tape, more specifically, focusing on nasal breathing during live rolls, conditioning training, and sleep, arguably has been my number one secret weapon when it comes to increasing my own conditioning on the mat. This is something that I have said just so many times, time and time again, I have been looking, I mean, I for years I've been searching for anything that I could do to get better on the mat. I want when I was wrestling, I was looking for ways to be a better wrestler. As I've been doing jujitsu, I've been looking for ways to be a better jujitsu athlete. And the thing that I wish I picked up so much earlier was nasal breathing. Nasal breathing is essentially when you inhale and exhale through your nose. The first thing to point out about nasal breathing is that it, it, it is a more efficient breath breathing in and out of your nose than compared to breathing in and out of your mouth or even breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Breathing in and out of your nose requires less energy to intake air, process that air in your lungs, and then therefore deliver oxygen to where it needs to go. If you can deliver more oxygen without using as much energy, that is a big plus when it comes to enhancing your conditioning and being more effective in dragging your opponents into deep water on the mat. Now, nasal breathing is also a more effective breath. Nasal breathing is more effective when compared to mouth breathing, excuse me, nasal breathing is more effective when compared to mouth breathing because mouth breathing does not allow you to take in the greatest amount of air possible. And mouth mouth breaths are typically more frequent and shallow than nasal breaths. When you start to breathe more frequently and you start to breathe more shallowly, you are essentially getting closer to hyperventilating. And this is a really, really, really quick way to get really tired really fast. And if you don't believe me, breathe in and out of your mouth as fast as you can and as hard as you can for 30 seconds and just think about how freaking tired you are after that. And you haven't even been doing anything. You've just been breathing. Now imagine doing that while you're trying to lift or while you're trying to do jujitsu. You see, your nose was specifically designed to be the primary structure of your head and face to intake air, process that air, and deliver oxygen, or put that air in the lungs, and then have those processes deliver oxygen to the working muscle, and have your nose get rid of the waste, which is carbon dioxide. 
nasal breathing will help you last longer and not redline as quickly on the mat, which is absolutely huge. Your blood lactate threshold is the point at which your muscles can no longer contract and work at the same pace as your body's ability to buffer lactate. When you are contracting muscles and you're doing a lot of contractions going at once and you're working at a hard pace, part of the chemical reaction that happens in your muscles, uh, a byproduct of that is lactate. Now the lactate acid or the lactic acid does not necessarily cause the burning sensation in your in your muscles. That is a, um, I mean, they used to think it was the lactic acid buildup was what caused your muscles to burn. And that's kind of true, but not entirely. Your muscles are producing lactate and then your body's response is to buffer lactate. And part of that process releases a hydrogen molecule and then your body buffers that hydrogen molecule. If you're producing so much lactate and it's happening so much faster than your body's ability to buffer that lactate and take care of that hydrogen ion and prevent the pH of your blood from dropping, then if you can't keep up with that pace, then you're essentially going to redline. And if you can't buffer the lactate, your body's going to literally force you to slow your pace down to one that can equally work and buffer lactate at the same rate. Nasal breathing allows you to increase your work rate while also improving your ability to buffer lactate. So you're essentially doing more work at a faster pace without getting as tired. In this, if you can develop and and build the habit of nasal breathing while you're doing your live rolling, while you're doing all of your conditioning, this is one of your best weapons on the mat, both in training and in competition. And if you start playing around with nasal breathing, start by focusing on nasal breathing during your 10 minute walks. It can be really tough if you try to jump right into doing all your conditioning with putting mouth tape over your mouth to force nasal breathing. It can be really tough to jump right into all of your live training by just focusing on nasal breathing right away. So just start by taking three 10 minute walks a day and focus on nasal breathing. Once you can complete a full 10 minute walk while nasal breathing, go ahead and progress to just go into jujitsu and do all of your technical drilling, just light pace, you're not going too hard or anything, you're just learning the technique of the day. Progress to doing all of your technical drilling on the mat while focusing on nasal breathing. Then as you get a little bit more comfortable, try to focus on nasal breathing while you're doing your live rolling. And eventually you'll wanna work to a point where you can do 90% of your live training on the mat and all of your conditioning in the gym while nasal breathing. So for myself, I first got turned on to this in 2019, I believe. It was when I first heard about nasal breathing. Uh, My good friend and mentor, Mark Simile Bell, first told me about it. And that was huge for me because not only did all my conditioning metrics in the gym improve, but I was rolling a lot better. I wasn't getting as tired. I could roll for days and I would get fatigued for sure. I don't want to say like I was like Wolverine and I never got tired, but I never really gassed out in training and it was awesome. And now don't get me wrong. Sometimes you roll with a really hard partner and they are pushing you and it's going to, you're going to have to start breathing through your mouth because they are pushing you to such a hard pace. It's going to be hard to maintain nasal breathing, but I'd say 90% of the live training rounds I do, I'm nasal breathing pretty much the entire time. And that's been huge as far as helping me be able to um, just improve my conditioning, be a better grappling athlete. All the athletes that I work with uh, who are competitive in jujitsu, I work with them to develop their ability to improve their nasal breathing. Sometimes that's with literal mouth tape where I'll say, hey, for these conditioning drills, you're going to do 30 seconds on, 90 seconds off. I want you to sprint as hard as you can, but you need to have a piece of tape over your mouth to to force nasal breathing. So sometimes I'll do that. But ideally, you want to get to a point where you are in such a habit of nasal breathing that you don't even think about it. You're nasal breathing essentially all throughout the day and you're only mouth breathing when you're talking or maybe when you're doing some super high intensity sprint where it's just not uh it's just not feasible to maintain nasal breathing to reach that maximum intensity but i'll say this any conditioning drill that i do where i'm sprinting absolutely as hard as i can i've gotten to a point where i could sprint max effort on a, on the concept two rower i could sprint max effort on my feet i could sprint and go as hard as i freaking can max effort on like a sled push or something and i'm i feel pretty comfortable maintaining nasal breathing so it may seem really difficult it may seem really daunting right now but trust me it's gonna be okay your body will adapt you just got to stick with it 
And then uh, uh, if you, if I may go on one small tangent about nasal breathing, if you really want to maximize your sleep quality, you can place a small piece of tape over your mouth to help with nasal breathing during sleep. Now, I know it sounds really freaking weird and whack, but trust me, it works better than any other sleep aid I've tried in the past. I've been doing this for two years now, and it is incredible it i sleep so freaking good and it's significantly different like it's a night and day difference not just on how i feel but i also use a, a sleep app on my phone called pillow which it uh it gives you like a reading in the morning like oh you had 80 percent sleep quality or you were a, you know you were in bed for this amount of time but you were in deep sleep during this amount of time every single time i kid you not i tape my mouth shut and go to bed, I sleep so much better than compared to when I used to sleep just with no mouth tape. And I wouldn't say I'm even that big of a snore either. Uh, my wife never said I snored that much. She said I do shake a lot, and that's usually because I'm dreaming about jujitsu. I'm like trying to hit an arm drag real quick on, on somebody in my dream, or I'm having dreams about being Batman. But I'll say this, even though I wasn't really that big of a snore, if you are a snore, nasal breathing and using mouth tape while you sleep is so important. You really want to make sure that you're getting the most you can out of you, out of your sleep so you can maximize your recovery from training session to training session. And adding a little bit of mouth tape uh, while you sleep is a great way to go about that. So just to review, three unique tools that you could use to develop your conditioning First one is gonna be the Concept 2 Rower. It's a great full body concentric only exercise that you could use to develop both your anaerobic conditioning, which is your short sprint, high intensity type of conditioning, and your aerobic conditioning, which is your longer duration, lower intensity, so a lot of times lower paced or slower paced type of conditioning. The second unique tool is going to be a sled, or if you don't have a sled and you push a prowler, that works as well. Again, it's a great piece of it's a great piece of equipment that allows you to train concentric only conditioning based movements and you could use it to develop your aerobic conditioning and your anaerobic conditioning and then unique tool number three is mouth tape it's that's kind of like a cop out it's a unique tool but essentially the tool itself is just your lips being shut and your nose doing all the work when it comes to inhaling and exhaling the air and it's just, I mean, I've already been talking long enough about the benefits of mouth tape and nasal breathing, but primary benefit is that it's the, a more efficient breath so you can intake more oxygen, process it more efficiently, and deliver it to the working muscle using less energy, which helps you last longer in matches and in, comp in, uh, in training. And then it's also more effective in being able to intake more oxygen and deliver more oxygen quickly to the working muscle. Thank you guys so much for watching. I guess you're not watching. Well, maybe you're watching on YouTube, but whatever you're doing, watching, listening, whatever the case may be, thank you so much for tuning in to episode 11 of the Strength Matrix podcast. I really love doing these podcasts and I have so much fun every time I get to hang out and chat with you guys. I got my coffee here with me, so this is like the funnest thing ever. I just get to drink coffee and talk strength and conditioning, which is my favorite thing ever. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode and got value out of it, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or uh, whatever podcast player you're listening to this. And I'd also really appreciate it if you gave it a five-star rating or whatever rating you believe is appropriate. And then if you really wanted to, what would mean the absolute most to me is if you shared it on social media and tagged your boy at Joshua Settledge. If you guys are interested in learning how you can roll harder on the mat, train smarter in the gym, and ultimately win more matches and get injured less, the Strength Matrix is offering a free four-week world-class training program to all the listeners of this podcast. So if that's something you're interested in, you want to level up your jujitsu game by getting stronger, you want to decrease your risk of injury on the mat in training and in competition, go ahead, go ahead and click the link in the description below of this podcast episode. You can just drop in your email and you'll get that free training program sent directly to you. Thank you guys so much for listening and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.